Okay, hello and welcome to the Enterprise Excellence um, Network webinar series. So today we are joined by Philip Holt. Um, Philip is having issues um, with computer issues, technical issues. So uh, it may be that we might not actually see Philip, but we will hear him and um, we're going to control the presentation for him. So sorry for uh, the slight delay in starting today, but Welcome, Philip, and thank you for joining us today. Um, so Philip will be presenting on the human factor to a lean transformation. Um, just a bit about who we are at the network before we start. So for those who aren't familiar with us, we are a network based in Europe, um, founded by Professor Peter Hines, and our network um, is in partnership with best practice host sites um, and led by Peter Hines, the various workshops that we hold throughout the year. Um, so today's session will be a 30 minute presentation by Philip and then a Q&A session at the end um, where you're, you're able to ask any questions you may have for Philip. So all being well, I will hand over to Peter um, just to say a few more words about Philip, if that's okay. Okay, thank you very much, Emma, and uh, welcome everyone to the session. Sorry, we're just uh, trying to uh, trying to get everything to work this in. Um, so um, before we start, I'll I'll just say a few words about uh, Philip and uh, a little bit about what what he's going to cover with you. Um, so Philip's one of those uh, <clears throat> rare individuals that um, working in industry he's actually done quite a lot of research and thinking um, about lean and the wider aspects and uh, he's written uh, two books I think two maybe even more than two um, on on the subject area and um, his career has taken him to to various com uh, companies um, most uh, most sort of prominently was the work when he was heading up the the lean activity at Philips, um, the electronics company, and more recently he's moved to GKN Aerospace, um, which is why we're having a few problems because of um, defense industry firewalls and, and so forth. So that's a little bit uh, around uh, Philip. So uh, just trying to get some information for you. And I think we should be able to, to do this. Um, so maybe we'll come back, um, we'll try and get going in uh, maybe two or three minutes time. So if you want to just bear with us a, a second, that would be, uh, that'd be great, thanks. Okay, I now have it, Peter. So I'll make myself a presenter and share my screen. Okay, perfect. Can you see that? It's visible on my side, thank you, Emma. Yes, very good, thank you. Okay, okay we, we can Great. make a start. I, Philip, I, I, I did do a brief introduction to you. Um, so um, I think if you wanna just take it away, that would be, that'd be great. Yeah, ab absolutely. So yeah, thank you, uh, Peter and Emma. Um, and apologies to the attendees for those technical issues. Um, yeah, I, the good news is I can tell our IT team that our um, firewall is working well, um, and and assure our customers that we don't have any uh, any uh, vulnerabilities here. Certainly, in terms of getting on to go to webinars. Um, so yeah, what, what I'd like to talk about today is um, you know the human factors of a lean transformation. As uh, as Peter said, I, I've been involved. Uh, well, I've been involved in this industry for 35 years, but I've been involved really in deploying lean transformations across organisations um, for about 14, 15 years now. Um, and it's been it's been a revelation and it's something that I never thought I would make into a career, but it, it's really become a vocation uh, for me. So as, as Peter said, I've written two books. We'll come to that in a moment. But I've I've also written a third one, which is currently with Rutledge in terms of um, uh, being published, and and we expect that out in spring next year. And it's really around living lean, um, and it's around how you actually take that human factor into a lean transformation, which I personally, through my own studies and experience, believe is the the really the key differential between a successful and an unsuccessful transformation of any time, let alone a, a lean transformation. 
So if we could go to the next slide, please, sir, Emma. Um, I'm going to start with, with my Lean Centre of Excellence mission. Um, so the Lean Centre of Excellence, we're the, we're the central organisation in GK and Aerospace that's responsible for the deployment of Lean across our organisation. We have a very clear remit that it's our job to help and enable the organisation to become self-sufficient in this. We're not here to be the holders, the key holders, the gatekeepers of our lean knowledge in, in GK and Aerospace. It's our job, it's our role to actually engage and fuse um, and, and ensure that the organisation understands that the best way for us to achieve our overall goals um, and to make our customers really happy as we become the best aerospace company in the world is by developing what we call our army of problem solvers. So our, our mission in our centre of excellence is very simple. We want to be that great place to work and a company that our customers love. So we need to be excellent in all that we do. And we're going to achieve this through our lean operating model, engaging our people in operational excellence. And together we'll become an army of problem solvers who constantly improve the value for our customers. So that, that's really the mission of, of my team. So on the next slide, um, Peter's already said quite a bit about me, so I'm not going to repeat it too, too much. Um, I'm the SVP for Global Transformation um, and Lean Transformation within GK and Aerospace. Um, and I am the author of, of two books, Leading with Lean and, and the Simplicity of Lean. And the company I work for, I'm really excited to be part of GK and Aerospace. Fantastic business. Um, we're going to be around £3 billion worth of sales this year. Um, we've got 41 sites across the globe, probably more sites than you'd expect for the size of the company. But being in the defence industry as well as the civil industry, um, we have got what we call economic participation requirements with our customers. So that it means that we have to be in geographies where our customers' customers are um, and we need to have that proximity. So we do have probably more sites than you might expect. Um, but we've, we've got a very good way of, of managing that, again, through our lean operating model and a, a mixture of a business line and regional focus. We've got four global technology centres, which are really focused on delivering those future technologies. We have very long product life cycles in this industry. Um, but at the same time, we need to be thinking a long way ahead in terms of new technologies. Um, and of course, you know, making um, our products lighter to make them more sustainable and also looking forward to the electrification of, of flight um, are two key areas that we're heavily engaged in. We've got about 15,000 employees, we're across 13 countries and we're on board about 100,000 flights a day. I mean, there's a very good chance if you get on an aeroplane, a bit difficult at the moment with COVID, but when you do get on an aeroplane, um, you're likely to be in a plane that has parts that we've manufactured. So on the next slide, um, just I won't spend too long about GK Aerospace, but just to give you the full picture, we cover the civil airframe, the defence industry and engines. Uh, and as you can see, we're about a third in each of those. So our lean operating model, I've mentioned a couple of times, and it's what we call creating the environment in which to live our values. The five values you see here are the values of GK and Aerospace and how we become a great place for our people to work. Um, and, and we've got the safe, respect and care, open and honest, innovative and ownership values. But what's really interesting about how the lean operating model focuses on that is that it's really, again, about that enablement of our people. So again, back to what I mentioned earlier, it's about the humanity. It's about focusing on our people um, and ensuring that the way that we get our results is through people who come in and want to expend that discretionary effort. That's something you can never tell or ask somebody to do. It's something that people volunteer when they feel engaged with your organisation. And that's through living our values, how we can become the place where people want to expend that discretionary effort. So if we move on to the next slide, what, you, what you'll see is, you know, again, links back to the books I wrote, but I wrote these books based on sharing the, the experience and, and the, the analysis that I've done over the years of how we've been successful in first in Philips, then in Travelport, and now in GK and Aerospace. 
Um, and the third book I've written uh, around living lean is because I felt that there was kind of a, a, a triangle to close, if you will, um, because I'd wrote about leading with lean um, and around the four types of leadership. Again, very much people focused, but it, it still probably was very much, uh, um, you know, focused on the engineering or a, a logical approach to, to leading lean. And I think the the human part of it, the people part, there was probably still too much below the surface and implied. The second one I wrote got closer to that, and this was around what I called do it. Uh, the simplicity of lean talks about how we get into that culture and kaizen part of people engagement and then the projects and kaizen events that process improvement part and so the final book i'm writing is or i've written is around how to live it um, and this is about how you learn and understand the lean principles how you practice them on a daily basis and how you internalize them and believe in lean leadership um, and one of the the drivers of writing this, as we get onto the next slide, it is the BTFA model, the Believe, Think, Feel and Act model. And this is a model that, that's um, been developed by David Borvis, actually become a good friend of David's over the last few years as we you know, started to spar. We started to spar and talk about lean transformation. He comes at his research, his analysis from a, a different viewpoint than me but we've really found ourselves we've found a coming together of minds in terms of you know what really matters when we're trying to achieve um, transformation change engagement of people and the BTFA cycle the Bulvis cycle was something that really brought to life something that I'd really been experiencing and the fact that that logical PDCA, I'm, I'm an engineer, I have an engineering degree. Um, and, and having an engineering degree, I'm very logical traditionally in the approach that I take to things. And I'd realized over the years that, you know, the most logical of things, the things that seemed, you know, eminently obvious to everybody, didn't actually land, didn't actually take hold. And, and it, you know, from an engineer's perspective, it seems incredible that that's the case. Why, why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't it take hold? But it soon became clear that this was all about people. It was about people's belief, people's buying, people's ability to really believe in what was happening. And the BTFA model really, really explains that quite well. So I, I've adopted the, the Baldi cycle, this BTFA, um, as the way that we, we in GKN Aerospace, talk about change, talk about change management. So just to briefly take you through this, we, we've got the first part, the B, the believe. As we go through problem solving, planning of change, we've got to create that belief that it's the right thing to do. We sometimes refer to this as stakeholder management, forming a guiding coalition, if you look at Cotter's change management, change leadership or other approaches which accept that change requires the acceptance of people involved. I think the difference when you really get embedded in the Bulvis model is that this is more than a tick box exercise. Again, I see so often change management done in an engineering way. It's kind of the irony of it is that you get engineers trying to do change management with checklists. Um, have we got a communication plan? Check. Have we um, uh, got the team together and talked about what we want to do in the change check, et cetera? Have we got a, a vision of what we want to achieve? Check, burning platform check. It, it's all very engineering, logically focused. It's not really focusing on do people actually believe in what we're trying to achieve? When people have got that belief, they, they start to think about what's happening. Um, it's experienced and processed by the people involved. We need to understand what they're thinking about the change. How is it affecting them? What, what's, what's good? What's bad? And, and people are going to have feelings. Again, David could explain this much, much more um, in depth and much more scientifically than I can. Um, but, but from my experience, you know, it's again, it's, ex, it's really helped to explain how we feel a lot of what happens. This is this um non-verbal part of our brain the most primitive part of our brain that reacts to stimuli reacts to challenges reacts to stretch situations um, and really puts us in a position where sometimes we're, we're feeling a reaction it's call it instinct call it intuition call it gut feeling there's there's a there's a non-verbal reaction and that's very much around the emotional side of how we're, we're reacting or responding to change and then of course 
all of that drives the outcomes, drives the act of, of this. And, and what's interesting here, I've got to point this out, if you look at the model on the right hand side, which is uh, taken straight from David, um, it's, a, it's a copyright of, of his, of course. Um, BTFA, you'll see the way it's written in this model is BTAF, if you take it in a, a clockwise manner. Um, and it's very deliberate from David's perspective, because you'll see on my next slide when we go over that I've actually got it as um, BTFA in a clockwise manner. And the reason he's deliberately done it like this in this image is that he doesn't want people to get too much of an impression that it's a purely circular um, sequential model. It's very much an interactive model where your feelings affect the way that you think, the way that you think is affecting your belief, the way that you believe is affecting the way that you act, etc. So it's very much an interactive model. It's certainly not a logical sequence. Again, there's very little about BTFA that's, that's logical in the way that it affects behaviour. So if we do move to the next slide, you'll see a, an image that we've put together to try and help to explain to people that plan, do, check, act is not going to get us the change that we want. Change isn't logical. Change isn't just something that you plan out and do in a logical fashion. So whether we call it PDCA, the, the purists out there will, will correct people and say it's a PDSA. Um, however we want to talk about it, that doesn't really matter. It, it, that's a logical way of approaching it. Schuert, Deming cycle. And it's great, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we should forget it, tear it up. We need a framework, we need a logical way of planning a change. But what we also need to do is understand the BTFA part of it, the belief, think, feel and act part of it, this Bovis cycle. And, and I really genuinely believe here, I've said that David's a friend of mine, but I don't mean this in, in any kind of um, manner of, of wanting it to happen because he's a friend. I mean this because it's such a great model. I really hope it becomes as well known as the Schuert Deming cycle because we need that. We need that, especially in industry, especially in, you know, in the day to day lives of people. We need to understand what's happening with people as we make change, whether that change be large or small, you know, over a long period of time or a short period of time. We need to be having these conversations about what's happening emotionally to people as we go through change. So if we move to the next um, slide, I thought, okay, in case anybody's in any doubt, I thought I'd try and prompt, um, you know, some examples of the BTFA effect. And, and I thought I'll, I'll do something that's, you know, I'll take some really big stuff that, that people are aware of and it's happened over many years. So first one is the earth being spherical rather than flat. So, you know, Copernicus and co back many centuries ago kind of convinced most people that the earth was spherical. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of evidence out there. But there are still, despite that, even in this day and age, there are people who believe that the earth is flat and that it's a big conspiracy to pretend that it's spherical, in fact. Um, and, and that's nothing about logical um, thinking. That That is really an emotional BTFA effect. You know, when we talk about that, people will talk about it, they don't believe. It's about the feelings they have towards the people who are trying to tell them that it's spherical. So again, it's very much this BTFA effect that's that's involved here. Heliocentrism rather than geocentrism, you know, the fact that the Earth rotates or orbits, I should say, around the sun rather than the sun and the rest of the galaxy orbiting around Earth. Um, again, it took a long time and, and, you know, this isn't, you know, we can laugh about it, but actually people have been executed for believing this and for stating this and um, you know and it took a long time despite the logic despite the evidence for people to actually get on board with this the equality of all people under the law we know we know there's still very much movements talking about how we're, we've not reached that point even in the so-called developed uh, and, and um, democratic countries um you know again there's no logical reason why everybody isn't equal under the law but there's very, very many BTFA struck emotional reasons of bias and other feelings and beliefs that get in the way of that. And then also universal suffrage, the democratic vote for all, whether that's based upon sex or based upon race. You know, why wouldn't we have one vote, one person, one vote? You know, why wouldn't that 
be the case. But still, we know many lives have been lost and many people have been imprisoned as a result of that, that unfortunately, still ongoing argument in many places around the world. So, you know, logic doesn't always overcome. Um, in fact, I would say there's very few cases where logic, purely logic, overcomes. And there's more, you know, immediate um, <laughs> examples as well, such as vaccinations of COVID uh, for COVID as well, which we see is a is a big problem, which again is not really a logical argument. It's a BTFA argument. So again, next next slide. Again, just one one last argument, uh, one last uh, example, which I think is a, a great example here, because this probably if you're going to write about something that should purely be able to rely on PDCA, it would be the story of Joseph Lister and uh, the use of antiseptic during surgery. Great example, Joseph Lister. He was a Scottish British surgeon from Glasgow. Um, he ended up working at, uh, at King's College Hospital in London. Um, he applied Louis Pasteur's advances in microbiology to champion the use of antiseptic in, in surgery. It distinguished him, ultimately, he's now known as the father of modern surgery. And, and his evidence showed clearly, you know, with mortality rates, that using antiseptic produced significantly higher survival rates, lower mortality rates for surgery patients. The logic was clear. And the people he was trying to convince of this were highly educated surgeons who he worked with, who knew him, hopefully at least before this argument started, respected him, and should have been people of medicine, people of logic, and yet they refused to use his techniques. And it took over a decade before his employer, King's College Hospital, and its doctors and nurses accepted his work. And this was despite him being the professor of surgery. So the most senior person in surgery is showing with logic, with evidence, with data, that this is the right thing to do, yet people would not, his colleagues, his peers, would not accept that. Now that, that is not a PDCA story, that's a BTF, BTFA story. What's really interesting if you read about this further is in fact, this decade or so that it took, the change wasn't really about changing the minds of his peers. It was actually about a new generation of doctors, of surgeons coming through who didn't have the same biases and were willing and able to be open-minded as they came in to surgery and just accept that this was a good practice that would make them more successful as a surgeon. So again, I, I shared this because I think it's a really great example of how change is not about the logic. It's not about PDCSA, uh, PDCA. So on the next slide, if we talk about, you know, why do we need to gain this belief? Why do we need to, to think about this? Well, it fosters the ability and willingness to adapt. Yeah, it really is about gaining that belief, gaining that buy-in, whatever we want to call it, that acceptance. You know, people really feeling that this is the right thing to do is what's going to foster the ability and willingness to adapt. So that's how we start getting people out of the current tank and into the new tank. And the next slide is, is where I, I, you know, I just wanted to, I know Toyota always pops up somewhere when we're using the lean word. Um, but at Toyota, they say, we don't build cars, we build people. Our people build cars. And again, we've, we've really embraced the humanity behind the Toyota production system, the Toyota way, you know, what real true lean is all about. It's around building our people. It's about building and creating and helping to get this army of problem solvers who are every day going to solve their own problems. We're, we're not superheroes in my team. You know, we're not going to come in with our capes and our underpants over our, um, our, over our trousers and try to solve problems for people. You know, that's not our job. Our job is that we should go with humility. We should take the expertise we've gained across the years and we should help our colleagues who are experts in what they do. They do the job every day. They make the best aerospace products in the world. And it's for, up to us to help them to understand how they can do that better. So we want to build their capability to build our pro products better. So I really do believe in that, that statement. So if we move to, to the next slide, we, you know, 
this is a bit of a joke i'm sure people have seen this before it's it's a metaphor this is around gaining commitment so if you look at you know the chicken and the pig you know if we put those guys into a an english breakfast scenario or an irish or scottish breakfast scenario um if we click one down we'll see that the the chicken is actually involved um and the pig is committed so what we're essentially trying to do is we're trying to get our people to be lean pigs now i wouldn't suggest that you go around and tell people you want them to be a lean pig um, but metaphorically speaking we want people who are all in if you will that are really really committed to the change that we're making um, and, and i see this regularly i see this you know people who will make the right noises who will say the right things who will you know really wax lyrical about what we're going to do with our lean transformation but essentially are not part of it they're not really committed they're, they'll they'll say the right things they'll be involved but they're not committed so we need to make sure we're gaining that commitment and again this is a btfa thing getting somebody to really give that discretionary um to expend that discretionary effort is not a logical thing you can't get somebody to logically commit to that it really is an emotional response so let's just um talk a little bit about the barriers to change so there are there are a number of barriers to change i'm not going to go through them all in the interest of, of time um but one of the first i think this is a really interesting one and, and i'm probably going to be controversial and say this but a lot of the people who have the job title whether it be lean expert ci practitioner transformate lean transformer six sigma green belt black belt whatever it whatever the nomenclature is that they're using for their role a lot of them are on the tip of the dunning kruger effect their confidence is is nearly total but their experience and their real knowledge is is quite low and this is the dunning kruger effect colloquially we can talk about this being a little knowledge is dangerous um, there's a lot of people who've got a, you know, have had a few weeks of training development and then they've repeated that for many years and they've never really got past that, that overconfidence in what their experience and expertise is. I, I personally, in 2008, when I went out to Japan, had a, a, a rude awakening about my lack of real knowledge and experience um, in lean. Um, and, and really it was a humbling experience. So I'm not criticizing people. But what we need to do is create an environment where people can understand where they sit in the the learning cycle um and uh, you know the the cycle on the right there of going from unconscious incompetence getting people to be consciously incompetent allows them then to go through that dunning kruger curve and come out the other end being consciously and then finally unconsciously competent being a true expert another thing on the next slide is around the language of excuses so you know think about this you know what do people say when they're late for a meeting um, sorry that i'm late i was tied up in the earlier meeting the reality is they normally chose to stay in the previous meeting considering it a higher priority to this one you know it is a choice nobody's tied us up physically we have made a choice to stay in the meeting you know another example sorry i'm late it's a 10 minute walk between buildings the reality is you decided to leave insufficient time to get to your meeting and we all do this it's very much human it's about not being rude about being polite you know we make these excuses but it's not actually productive in terms of showing respect for each other if we use this kind of these niceties we need a bit more honesty in the way that we communicate about the choices that that we make similarly on the next slide it's the urgency trap um you know I see so many people, I do a lot of coaching, especially with senior leaders, but also people throughout the organization who are constantly busy working on stuff. And when we really look at it, and we can use this simple two by two matrix, you know, there's a heck of a lot of stuff that's in the challenge quadrant, the stuff that we really should challenge. The importance is relatively low, but the urgency is high because people are shouting and screaming for it. When we start to really challenge, why do we need it? normally it becomes a oh because we need it response when you really challenge the why you get to a point of well actually we don't know and you can start to then eradicate some of that that work similarly 
when you look at the high urgency, high importance, where we've got focus, that's quite a polite word, way of saying it. Really, I'd say that's more the firefighting range when we've left it too late. So what we want to try and do is get as much as possible into the schedule area where we know what's highly important and we're getting it done before it becomes too urgent, before it becomes a point where people are screaming for it. And there's a couple of other things that get in the way of that. Um, that drive procrastination on the next slide. One of them's uh, what's deemed Parkinson's law. Um, it's the, what, what it is, it's humans tend not to finish their tasks ahead of time, even though they have the chance to do so. You know, it's that kind of, you, you get the, the Pareto rule on it. You know, 80% of the work's probably done in the first 20% of the time, but people go on and maybe perfection gets in the way of great. Um, so one of the things, again, I try to coach people to do, and, and you'll see this in concepts such as minimum viable products is, you know, start when you've got something that's 80% good, go talk to the customer of what you're creating to get their feedback so that you can course adjust rather than spending a heck of a lot of time trying to get it perfect when actually when you confront the customer with it, they maybe don't see that as perfect. And then you've got student syndrome. Again, another thing that gets in the way of people, and it's called student syndrome because we all know when we're at university, you know, when we had deadlines, we would maybe go out partying. You know, there's still a week left, there's still four days left, there's still three days left. You end up cramming in in the last uh, day and an evening to to get the to the deadline because you you put things off, especially if you've got time buffers. So that's why we try and get short interval control in place to really say, okay, if something's due in six months. What needs to happen this week? What needs to happen next week? How do we ensure we don't end up five months in and, and late? And then the last barrier I'm going to talk about is, you know, pretty quick one to talk about on the next slide, which is, you know, ignoring BTFA. And that's, I've left that to last, but that's the biggest one as probably, or hopefully is coming across as I've talked about this throughout this presentation, ignoring that BTFA element and really focusing on plan do check act which again tends to happen when people are under time pressure can be a major mistake and if we had more time i could talk you through several issues that i've had in my career because we've got far too project management far too logical and not taking the people along with us so next slide if we we're going to talk uh, very briefly about making the change so what are we going to do to make the change well the first thing to do is to accept that if you're too busy, you're not doing it right. If you're proud of being too busy, I'm sorry, but you're doing something wrong. And I often upset or offend people when they tell me how busy they are and how many hours they're working. And I say, well, you're not doing a very good job, are you? And, and that can be quite offensive, especially to professionals. But if you're going to be great at what you do, you've got to figure out how to do it well. Again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to tell you the story around this slide around squash, but I had a very interesting experience in my youth about the difference between somebody who knows what they're doing at squash and somebody who doesn't. And I can guarantee they were the one who wasn't too busy. I was and they won. And it's the same in business. So it's all about you. Next slide. This is what I call the, uh, the vision framework. You know, we focus a lot on problem solving, on continuous improvement, but that personal effectiveness is really what, what matters. And to help you with that, I've created a very simple change self-assessment um, on the next slide, which allows you to assess where you are in terms of, you know, your daily reflection, working with structure, focusing on emotional elements, not ignoring problems and making sure you change your ways of working to be effective. And the next slide just shows me I'm opening my kimono here. I talked about 2008 and the awakening that I had, and it shows you, you know, I was mostly ones and twos back in 2008 on this assessment. And I believe on my self assessment, I'm at fours and fives now. Um, and of course, my target is to be all fives in the future, if that is at all possible but that's what i strive for every single day and the next slide um he, he, i actually created this uh, slide before he won his latest gold medal at the olympics but Yulid kipchoge um 
this picture is when he actually won the marathon. Oh, sorry, won the marathon when he got the world record or unofficial world record, I should say, for running a marathon, um, and in under two hours. And what he used was what we would call in lean terms short interval control. He actually worked and, and working like you, Lid Kipchoge, you can't get more of a, a long distance project, if you will, than running a marathon. But what he did was he knew every second of every footstep of every meter that he was running, whether he was winning or losing. And that's what we need to get. To be personally effective, you need to know every hour of every day, are you winning or losing? Are you really doing what you should be doing? It's hard to do. It's hard to do. And it's a behavioral element, which the next slide shows. And it's about how do we intervene with our behavior to change our mindset, to change our culture in the organization. And BTFA, the focus on BTFA is what really, really achieves that, really, really gets you there. So I know I'm, I'm really out of time now. So what I'm gonna do very quickly, just go through these next few slides. So I talked about building an army of problem solvers. These are some of our people from one of our latest trainings. We don't focus on training, though. We focus on certification. We train people. They then go and make an impact on the business by going and applying the knowledge. We've got over 2,400 people certified at the Lean Foundation level. We've solved over 34,000 hazards in the first half of this year. We've solved over 25,000 Kaizen in the first half of this year. And we're rewarding our people, giving them that feedback all the time, you know, for Kaizen of the month, for the impact that they have, large or small, on our business. And we're doing that on the next slide by really building BTFA into the way that we do our lean deployment. Our lean operating model was written with PDCA and we've built BTFA into it. We're really ensuring that all the time, me, my team, the people in the sites are focusing on the BTFA elements. And the last thing I'm gonna say from a personal perspective is on the next slide, Hansai. The biggest, biggest, biggest impact I've had on my personal and professional life was adopting Hansai. Real steep self-reflection, looking at me, looking at the changes I can make, not blaming other people, not looking outwards, not saying if they would change their behavior, things would be better, but looking at myself, looking at what can go. And every day I spend a few minutes at the end of each day and I reflect on what were my key learning points today? What changes could I make? And any current problems that it would help to solve. And again, from a BTFA perspective, most of my reflection is behavioral reflection, not logical reflection. I can normally fix my technical mess ups pretty easily it's more the relationship emotional non-logical elements that that really make the difference to my way of working so i'd like to thank you for your attention on this sorry for the technical delay at the beginning but hopefully i've managed to get through my slides in a way that um, not only uh, gave you some logical insight but hopefully gave you uh, some emotional insight as well. Thank you very much, Philip. I, I think uh, I think um, that was very interesting and uh, very insightful and um, um, interesting to see the details of uh, some of the work there. And um, so, in my past, I've I've read um, something on this. There's a little article you wrote last year that's on the web. People can uh, have a Google of, or actually some of the original work from. David Bovis is actually on the web. He wrote a couple of years ago around this uh, this framework. But um, what we'd like to do is just open the uh, the doors to any uh, questions that you might have. Um, and uh, well, there's a comment here from Mark who says it's a uh, uh, Philip great topic, expertly communicated, well worth getting up at 6 a.m. for. So um, so I guess he's probably uh, somewhere on the uh, west coast in the U.S. So if you'd like to type any questions that you have into um, the question area, I'll read those out for uh, Philip and we'll have, a, we'll have a conversation. So we got one already coming in from Linda who says, how do you um, conciliate your role as a manager and a lean leader? 
Yeah, it's a it's a great question. So I think I've I've really gone in the time I've, I've been leading people for probably about twenty five to thirty years. Um, but I probably managed them for the first fifteen to twenty years of that, and then I probably started to lead in the last ten years or so um, because I really made a change from being logical having a meeting around you know where are you against your objectives to really talking about how are people developing themselves you know what what is it that they're doing to get better every day and how can i help them to get better every day so i, I really it maybe sounds a little bit cliched uh, uh, but you know i really see my role as one of lifting people up and helping them to give the best potential or meet the best potential that they can rather than managing um, so i've got some admin parts i have to uh, you know approve uh, expenses i have to approve holidays but my main focus is on helping people to build who they are okay great thank you um so there's a question coming in from harish here who says uh, hi philip thanks for the great presentation question understand the emotional part but how do you balance the impatient leadership who prefer instant results and not waiting for the emotional development of people? Yeah, again, fantastic question. It's the BTFA, the emotional part of it is about managing or leading in all directions. So part, part of my job is to, as much as my team and the people in the sites, it's to work to help my leadership, our executive committee, to, to get on board with what we're doing. And, and it's a balance because we do, of course, have to get results. So again, we'd need a lot longer than the time we've had today, but our lean operating model is actually specifically built. Right, okay, very good. Uh, we have quite a lot of questions, so I'll, I'll crack on. Um, so one from John here who says, do you use strategy deployment as part of the lean transformation? If so, what are the GKN's breakthrough objectives? focusing our resources and our people on delivering that. So it really is about BTFA and the emotional part, understanding that across the whole organization in all directions, including the leadership. Okay, all right, good. Let's, uh, so one from Paul here, um, who talks about, um, how did you see uh, Toyota using this kind of idea? As they seem very logical, and not emotional. Yeah, it, I've never talked to, to anybody at Toyota or when I've been on my visits, I think I've visited three different times to different sites in Toyota and they've never, they've never explicitly talked about this, but this is one of the things you find with Toyota. They, they're very open in giving you tours. You can pay to go and have a tour in many of their factories and they'll show you everything they do. Um, what you need to do is really understand what's under the surface because everything that you see is a very logical element it's it's the symptoms of the toyota way and actually when when you when you really look at what they do they enable all of their people to solve their own problems every day they really do work on btfa um, there's a there's a really um interesting set of um, advertisements they did probably about 10 to 15 years ago um, where they talked about my Toyota and they had their employees talking about their experiences in Toyota. There's a really famous one, Bridey Tucker. I think you can probably find it if you Google it. But there's uh, one of the female workers on the shop floor in one of the Toyota plants. And, and she talks about how she's empowered to stop the line if there's a problem, how she's able to solve a thousand problems every day in the site. And, and it's really a it really shows the the btfa element of what toyota does even though i don't think you'll ever hear a toyota employee talk about that mm -hmm. i can probably come in a little bit more on that one uh, for you paul um i've been doing a little bit of work with uh, toyota recently somewhat in this area and um what what they've done is um this this whole area of um philip showed the slide of you know we make cars and we make people is there's a couple of concepts coming out of Japan, which isn't just Toyota. So one is um, Monozakuri, which is about 
good manufacturing or we would probably say craftsmanship might be the better word so a pride in the product that we make that's as you know as good as we possibly could etc and the other is uh, hitazakuri which is basically the the one about we make people or we grow people or we develop people which which i think the the the, the btfa is is really speaking to but uh, if you get the opportunity um i don't know if you're in the uk paul but if you go to the Berniston Toyota site, um, they have an Abaya room, which looks at what I call the People Valley Stream, which is really the recruitment of people through the different levels, um, team member, team leader, et cetera, et cetera, and on how they develop these uh, the, the people. So it's not as explicit around the feelings and thinking, but it's more explicit around the role and behaviors, probably more traditional areas than, than we're seeing what uh, Philip's talking about. But it's not too dissimilar from some of the things that, that we've mentioned, but I, I think not quite at the same emotional explicit level, I would say. Okay, um, should we move on? So uh, Linda says, thank you. So there's one here from Lorraine who says, um, the pandemic has caused a change from, with many people's working from home. This will change behaviours and feelings with less face-to-face -face and ability to engage, uh, and to, ability to engage become, can become harder. How do you understand the emotions and feelings without direct contact? Yeah, it's a, it's an absolutely fantastic uh, point. We we've really spent a lot of time trying to uh, to work on that and part of it is building trust it, it gets more difficult to build trust when you're you're remote from each other um so we've spent a lot of time just just building trust spending a little bit more time to talk through you know what what's going well what's not going well and helping people to feel that they're in a safe environment to open up so you'll have seen one of our values is safe um, that safe isn't just physical safety, it's also emotional safety. Um, we, we have um, daily management has been rolled out across GK and Aerospace as part of our lean operating model, but we've also done that on a remote basis. And we have what we call our emotional state monitor, which basically at the start of each um, virtual uh, check-in, we, we will have indicated whether we're red, amber or green status in how we feel. Now, what, what you see is when you first do that, everybody's green nobody wants to admit there's a problem but as you build trust and especially as as a leader you you will show if you're red or you'll show if you're amber and you'll explain the reasons why people start to become more um, able and willing to to do that so I can pretty much tell you that if you look on any of our uh, virtual daily management boards you probably find that at least half of the emotional states will be at least amber uh, and there might be one or two people who are red and it doesn't mean that the, you know the world's falling in, but it means that they've got a problem, something's going on. It might be personal, it might be professional, and and the team will talk about that before you even start talking about metrics or or any of the actions that are ongoing. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question sounds like it could be a whole presentation, but anyway, well I'll give it to you. So it's from Dirk who says, uh, "What did it take to integrate BTFA into your model? Uh, can you describe the process?" How long did it take and what were some of the biggest obstacles? Wow, yeah, that, <laughs> when, when are we scheduling another couple of hours? Um, no, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a great question, Noah. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's an ongoing process. I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be very logical in my answer, as you can imagine, because it really was just about us having a session. We actually had a session with David Borvis. We got him in for a day and we, we spoke to him and really tried to understand in my leadership about BTFA. We then shared that and talked to my wider team about it. And then we just started inserting it into the development of our materials, into any conversation we have. We even in meetings will ask one of our people to, you know, perhaps intervene if we think we're, we're not focusing enough on the BTFA elements. And it's just been an ongoing process. Um, you know, one of one of my team members, our, our global lean leader, Anthony Howarth, um, he, he came up with a slide that shows how the lean operating model works from a PDCA and the BTFA thing. And it was just some hand size and reflection time he did. And he created that slide and then started sharing that with his team and having a dialogue with them. So it's mm -hmm. been very evolutionary. 
based upon you know getting that buy into the you know the irony is it was getting the buy into the model which is about getting the emotional buy in um and and we've we kind of followed that process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, Andy's question, I think, follows the same sort of theme. So he says, "How did you find the buy-in from the rest of the exec team?" Um, yeah, I, I think it, it's really the same. I, th I think because there's a lot of questions, I'm going to move on because I think you've sort of probably covered that one to a degree. Um, something else from Dirk here again. Um, how did you change your personal approach in guiding the transformation, influencing the leaders? Uh, what specifically did you do differently? So, again, good question. I mean, <clears throat> it's really about realizing why people are not realizing <laughs> what what you're trying to sell to them. So, you, you, we all do it. You'll put together a presentation. You might do an A3 problem solving, and you'll you'll present. You know what you think the problem was, what you think the the root cause was, and what you think we should do as countermeasures. And it seems inalienably logical, and of course everybody will immediately buy into it. And it was realizing that there's there's a certain element of lobbying you have to do. Maybe you go have some one to one discussions, understand the voice of the customer, if you will, speaking about executive senior leaders being customers trying to get what they feel about changing the language that you use and starting to talk about how do you feel about this i probably went through a, a massive change curve when i started really deploying lean where i thought it was all about logic it was all about a3 problem solving and i probably went far too much towards the engineering side and i had to pull myself back and start using more of the emotional language about how do you feel about this what what would this mean to you um so it's it's really just about investing that time in in more of those emotional discussions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so a question from me. Um, I'm just going to nip in here. So as you know, I've been doing some work in a similar area to 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 this and the work from David there, and looking at some of the psychology behind the you know the classic lean. And to my surprise, what I found was actually the psychology doesn't stack up too well. And so it's no surprise that we have problems engaging people and sustainability that because we're thinking of very much from the organizational perspective rather than the individual and obviously the emotion that you talked about. But the one the one other thing that came up in this, as well as belief, which comes out of the sort of Arzen uh, theory about theory of planned behavior is is around purpose and meaning. In other words, what what am I trying to achieve for myself? Um, as well as the organization or how do I create meaning for instance out of a KPI of improving productivity into some sort of metric that's meaningful for me as an individual so I just wondered what you thought about that sort of purpose meaning side as well as the belief as the sort of starting point of this type of cycle yeah I absolutely think it's a it's a very very important point Peter I'll give you a, probably to in the interest of time just a shortcut. I'll give you a great example of what we did in Philips when we were looking at reducing the month end close cycles. So the business need, the organisation need, was to get better and quicker and more reliable at doing month end close. But after we did our first workshop to determine what the problem was and how we were going to measure success, we actually had a really great breakthrough where we decided after listening to the voice of our finance community, that the biggest problem they had was that they worked too many long hours during month end close. They would work in some cases till after midnight. So we set a single metric for success, which was get home for dinner. Okay, and, yeah. and the idea was, and, and that's how we got buy-in and it was great. We had the whole finance community working towards get home for dinner, mm. um, but we achieved the business results as a, mm. out of that. Mm. That'd be a very good example of creating meaning out of a, a measure that people could relate to. So uh, yeah, very good. Okay, look, we've got a few more. I'm I'm gonna I think I'm gonna sort of go over a few minutes if you're okay, Philip, just to answer the questions. Um, yeah, um, that's fine. We've got quite a few more. So, so there's one from Stephen over there in Northern Ireland. Um, so he he's saying that you know that um, reflection's not sort of typical in the West as it is as in more in the East. So how have you managed to create this type of habit with the frontline leadership? 
to, to get this sort of cultural thinking into the reflection process? Well, again, I mean, this, this is an evolutionary process and we're not the, with everybody. Um, we're at different levels. So I, I personally, I've been practicing this for what, probably 14 years now. And I think I, I, I'm pretty good at it in terms of the impact it has on me. And that's what it's all about. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, if we go to our first line leadership, the shop floor, there are some people who are doing it really well. I, I would say that the, the, the great role models of it, other people haven't got it yet. But it's more about just just persisting in terms of, you know, keep teaching it, keep having those dialogues. Um, it's an aspect of almost everything we do in our lean deployment. Mm -hmm. You know, when we, run, when we run an activity or a Kaizen event, you know, we give people Hansai time. Um, so we, we just encourage right. people. And, and, and again, it's BTFA that's in play here. Some people will embrace it. Other people will resist it. Yeah, I mean, I, I always find that, um, you, you know, when we ever do, I don't know, a Kaizen event or something like that, you know, we usually build in, a, you know, in the standard PDCA, the, the check and act, which should be the reflection and what could we do better. But we, we usually so poor at managing it that we run out of time and that bit gets squeezed out. So... I think it's yeah. sometimes it's there, but we just don't manage well. So uh... anyway, um, one from Andrew, which follows on from that that same sort of theme. Um, so he was saying, obviously at Toyota, you've got the Sensei, the coaches coming round, and I suppose they're reinforcing the you know stick to standards and that abnormality management and PDCA, etc. So would you your coaches go round with a sort of BTFA? mentality as well as the sort of pdca at the same time and coach on that as well yeah absolutely that's you know my my team and as i say it's been an evolution in in the team but my my team it's very much and i think when we have new joiners they're very surprised at, at being confronted with this as part of their induction and competence development that we're talking to them about how they're going to gain the btfa elements in their the deployment it's you know the first time they've been asked to do this in many cases yeah. so so yeah that's that's what we're doing that's my team's raising that to, to be honest with you yeah yeah okay very good so um yeah, you've attracted a lot of interest here so i'll keep going so one from andy here who's saying um what what about this aspect of emotional intelligence in the organization do you know do you have enough emotional intelligence in the organization to be able to sort of make this 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 emotional lean buy-in work well i i guess to be honest with you if we were any industry where that you, you might be on your back foot it's it's the aerospace industry because it's full yeah. of en engineers um, yeah. so so you could you could say you're starting on your back foot but no i mean we're, we're all human beings and and actually it's, it's amazing when you see the change uh, in people and i think we're all capable we talk about emotional intelligence. There's probably some people, well, there are some people who have it naturally. They're, they're better at it naturally. But I, we can really start seeing a difference when we just give people the opportunity and, and, and they trust that we're in a safe organisation to have those conversations. I think that's yeah. more what it's about. It's about creating an environment where people feel safe to have those kind of conversations. Right. OK. I'm just going to do one as a follow up for Andy as well, who says, how long did it take? to to sort of get this model into place in in the organization well it's we're we're, we're in the midst of doing it it's i right. don't want to give anybody the impression that we've cracked it yet so uh, that, yeah. that, that we're you know it's everywhere it, it's in the process it's uh, the model is is in integrated in the way we deploy our lean operating model um but we're, we've got a few more years before we'll get at a point where i can say to come in and see any element of any part of our organization and you'll find it. We're not there yet, but we've got some fantastic examples of it all across the organization. Very good, very good. Uh, okay, so there's one from, uh, from, from my friend Adam here who says, um, how difficult was it to build BTFA into your LOM? I'm not sure what LOM is, but perhaps you know. Um, I, how, how does it change the steps you would take? So the LOM is the lean operating model. Um, okay. So so that it's our lean deployment model. Um, okay. So so yeah, I mean, it, it, as I said in one of the earlier answers, it was really about making it happen in a in very much a BTFA way. So we we've kind of 
introduced it to our team. Our team have developed it over the last 18 months to two years. And, and it's just started to be created. As they create new material, as they create new training, uh, people are, are, are integrating BTFA, the, the view of BTFA into that. So it's been yeah. very much an evolutionary process. Right. Okay. Um, we're, we're, well, um, three more, three more, four okay. more. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, so um, I'll, I'll close the doors there. So no more questions, please. So, so um, one from Andy is: Is it possible to get a copy of the slides? Yeah, there's nothing. Um, there's nothing really con uh, confidential in there. I can. I'll do a last check, but I should be able to okay. share them. Yes. And perhaps if you, you know, send a PDF over, we can circulate to, to people. Thank yeah. you for that. Um, so Ajit says, uh, B BTFA and PDCA, is DIY principle one of the important catalysts to really have both philosophies becoming part of culture? So by D DIY, do you mean do it yourself? Is that, is that I guess what so, we, yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, again, it, it's about getting our people to own this. You know, again, the only way people are going to believe in this and, and own it is if we give them the chance to do it so again my team is very much about giving people the chance to do it we don't we don't do it to our team members we we do it with them mm, yes i mean I, I certainly my own work in this sort of similar area is very much pdca is sort of more for the organization and, and this area is more for the individual and thinking about them and and their effectiveness their growth their development etc so i think that's quite a nice way of sort of bringing the two together Okay, so uh, where are we? Um, so we've got John. Do you have BTFA measures across each site within the company? Sorry, I managed to hit mute then. Um, no, we don't We don't measure. Um, as I mentioned in one of my earlier answers, really the BTFA part of it is really the check-in, the emotional state monitor. It, it's a great um, method of getting people to open up about how they really feel about what's happening um so that that's the way we do it again we you have to be careful not to get too logical about something mm. as <laughs> emotional so we find the emotional state monitor is the way that we make this happen mm. i mean my own again similar thinking to this my, my own feeling is if, if btfa or my version sort of similar to it is more for the individual. It's up to the individual to decide how they want to measure it and not necessarily share that and only sh share that if they want support and, and keep it you know, that, that way round rather than a sort of top-down thinking. So maybe that's the similar. Um, yep. Okay, so, um, you know, so last question and there's one comment that I'll just finish off with. Um, so again from Adam, is there a key takeaway uh, that you can share that on on how you might start this type of deployment in an organization just really just just try and understand what it means to you first individually and then start to talk it with your closest colleagues and really do this virally um, really really start to build that out through Again, gaining people's belief in the model and seeing how it works. So, you know, again, yeah. don't don't try and do it PDCA. Don't try and do it logical. Don't project manage it into the organisation. Just build it into what you're doing and start small and allow it to grow. Mm. Mm. Great. I think we are about there. But uh, there's a thank you from Adam. So th there's a comment uh, actually from a guy called David Bovis. I'm not sure if you know who he is, but uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so he says, great to see so much interest. Uh, thank you to both and the audience for discussing the model and how it's been applied uh, from from David. So I feel David's almost been the co uh, co presenter in a silent way on the presentation. So um, so well, thank you to you, Philip, and also to to David, who's obviously inspired a lot of your thinking here. That's certainly been a very interesting and thought provoking, as as evidenced by the huge number of questions that uh, that we've had. So. Thank you very much. Um, I will just hand over to Emma to close us out for today.
Thanks, Peter, and thanks very much, Philip. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining today. Sorry about the slight technical issues, but we got we got through it. Um, we hope to see you at our future webinars, which you can see um, on our website and also on the Lean Business Systems Group, which Peter posts on sort of every fortnightly. Um, but also, you'll receive a follow up email from myself now with some um, questionnaires to, to feedback to us, which is always useful, and some um, you're able to comment on what you would like to hear, hear of or hear from um, in our future webinars. So we hope to see you again. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a nice rest of your day. Thanks, Philip. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Again. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay.